Good afternoon. This is the second part of my second lecture. We began on the theorization of organizations and management in the last lecture, and we looked at various metaphors. What we would be doing is uh, in this particular part two of the lecture, we will definitely go beyond the metaphors that we actually have. And uh, we will start looking at various other concepts that will be, and also begin to share a little bit of our understanding so far. The organization, when we defined it as a working machine, and uh, by, 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 by a comparison to a working machine, what we were talking about is look at the complicity or the complications that are there within an organization. Basically, it's got various components which are built for efficiency and productivity. Now, what organization you can construe, what organization comes to your mind? Um, and you can take an organization which serves uh, the field of disabilities, clients, from disabilities or consumers from disabilities. What would that entail? It would entail um, not only collection of data around how many clients we have got in the community and what their disabilities are, but it also has to have enough data about the complications associated with some of the disabilities, the impacts of those disabilities. So as a result, it's not just social workers who get involved in that particular field. There are psychologists, social workers, occupational therapists, physio physiotherapists, recreational specialists, and a whole lot of others who are all involved. Apart from that, parents, stakeholders, the rest of the society, Everybody else gets involved. If there are people with disabilities who are able to uh, access and access not only some scholarships and uh, uh, certain facilities, there are others who are associated with it that are involved. If there are people with disabilities who can find some employment, some assisted employment, then there are those people who are associated with training people with disabilities that are involved. So it just gets complicated as a result of the specialism in an organization. So that's just an example that I threw there. Now organizations will dehumanize a psychic jail definition for employees as they are all just cogs in a wheel. You know, we looked at that. Um, you know, we also understood that it is just a perception of individuals. It's not necessary that every organization will perform itself as one which is requesting people to comply, asking people to uh, do what exactly it wants to do. There is always an opportunity for creative feedback. There's always an opportunity for people to co-create uh, the new realities, which obviously also require uh, to be thought over. So organization consists of people who competitively seek their self-interest in a capitalist economy. Um, certainly, yes, that could probably apply for uh, profit-making organizations. May not necessarily apply to the kind of uh, uh, organizations that we as social workers have involved, and it may not necessarily apply for several um, several levels of non-governmental organizations. The rational economic individuals can work hard to fulfill the moral and economic imperatives of the good life capitalism. Very well said. So in other words, capitalism allows people probably to think in terms of um, the welfare of other people who are unfortunately missing out. So uh, there, is a, there is an economic uh, rationale involved in the whole process. Look, we've got to have a fair way of looking at the world and a, you know, a way of looking at equity, looking at uh, provision of access to people. So that's one way of looking at uh, the rational economic principle that we should be looking at uh, here, understanding it. 
there is a theory of bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is all about how the government is. You know, whenever we, you know, whenever people, people use this word for them, for a whole lot of people, it's a fancy word. You know, something that you don't, uh, or you, you, you are expected to stand in a queue, then we take an application, fill it up, give it to the front office, and then of course there will be process. There's a date stamp, and then it moves to somewhere else, and it goes round and round and round. Now that could be interpreted as bureaucracy. It's also interpreted as red tape. The levels at which some of the the scrutiny that is involved and the levels at which paper trail moves on is one thing that some people like to use the term bureaucracy. Of course, bureaucracy is uh, inevitable part of public system, inevitable part of even private organizations. And, uh, but I suppose in private organizations, the degree of bureaucratic processes may be uh, a lot lesser. So then we have uh, issues in relation to, you know, in, in the government to non-governmental organizations, you know, the government has over a period of time um, outsourced a whole lot of activities that it, want, it could have been doing for a long time. And these outsourced activities, uh, when a non-governmental organization is expected to do, it is also, uh, it is, you know, sometimes it also might take up the same sort of uh, bureaucratic uh, um, outlook, or it might actually imitate the, uh, the organization which is expecting it to carry on its activities. So the, the, the reason why in, in, you know, for a long time, Max Weber series have been very, very popular. What's it about? Effectivity, simplified administrative systems, facilitating modern capitalism and uh, certainly moved away from traditional types of organizations which are focused on just a few charismatic individuals. And uh, that's the way in which bureaucracy was uh, described. A rational legal authority was the main underpinning principle which always looks at what is good procedure. Procedurally defined rules and regulations are always present. And that's the one which kind of governs the relationships between organizations, units, and the larger entity. The more constrictive the rules are, the more regulative the entire atmosphere becomes. Now let's look at further, further activity. There is a general tendency for people to think about a clear division of labor. Like I know what I'm supposed to be doing, my subordinate knows what he's supposed to be doing. And of course, further down the track. A team leader would know what he's supposed to be doing. A general manager would know that he doesn't have to go right to the grassroots unless some, some mess has happened at that particular level. With each level, there is a responsibility. With each level, there is a command chain principle that works. With each level, there is delegation that works. The higher, the higher the delegation. The lower, the lower the delegation. The authority arises from the position not filled by the individual, but by authority. So the authority dominates in a way, it's a written, it's a prescriptive authority. In other words, it's already spelled out very clearly who does what. You can't say, you know, some, when, when, when you hear in organizations, oh, I'm not allowed to do that. I have to take it to the team leader. Okay, that's fine. Then you want to hear further, but the team leader can sign off. Then the, the lady might even tell you that the team leader will have to take it to the manager. Then, then the manager might have to take it to the general manager, regional manager. So it goes on and on and on, depending upon what is the issue. Some people try to uh, come clear with the budgets that they can do. I'm allowed to do up to, I can sign off up to $1,000. I can't sign off to 5,000 because that's the prerogative of the team leader. Somebody else 20,000, somebody else 50,000. So it's monetarily one aspect of leadership that is controlled or decided on the basis of what a person can do. There's an efficiency uh, 
relationship here. In other words, it has the delegation allows people to remain efficient. The emphasis on inefficient inefficiencies is reduced. As companies create broader laws, broader regulation, there's a symbolic meaning which is associated with it. So rigid actions and resistance to change sometimes comes up too much red tape definition. People do take that sort of a view. You know, I, I gave a complaint to minister and that's how it was so quick. It depends. Why did the minister act on it? Maybe there was a public interest issue in it. Maybe you might have given a threat saying that you might want to go to ABC or Channel 9 or Channel 7. Depends upon what it is. If everybody went to the minister, everybody gave a ministerial or an application to the minister, the, the, the local office will have only ministerials. And the minister will start saying, look, I've got 15 other people to work for me. Go there first, go to the office first. A reply will start coming to you from the PA, from the minister. Have you tried everything before you brought it to my notice? So there are exceptions which you will bring it to the minister. Take the example of refugees. Every now and then there are some stories which come about, genuine stories. That somebody's life is a threat. Somebody whom we've accepted for eight years, nine years already here is languishing in uh, Nauru or in Darwin or somewhere or the other. It's not a fair thing for us to do so. But what does the government uh, from the immigration secretary or somebody say? Look, I know you're all very sympathetic about this, but there are not exceptional reasons that I can press the law and release him. I don't believe that person needs to be here. I need more proof. So there is, a, there is a section in which it asks for more proof. So bureaucracy basically asks for more statements, more authenticity, more credibility, more proof. Bureaucracies of the late 20th century gave way to organizations more closely regulated by management. The scientific management theory, which was uh, propounded by Frederick Taylor, it is response to the industrial production. Managers and, managers and owners started monitoring actions to increase the efficiency of the profit-based organizations. Again, some of that scientific management theory is also applied in public sector. It's also applied in a way in the private non-governmental sector, but certainly much more so in the private sector and uh, in, in private enterprise. It, what does it say? It talks about, it, it gives us a mechanistic view of organizations that evaluate workflow processes and boost labor productivity. In other words, they concentrated on how do I make the horses run? How do I make the cold face work a little more? How do I make the last man run and run and run the organization? With an effectiveness, with the effectiveness that they want to have, it's primarily geared towards performance. So therefore, performance appraisals, therefore, diminishing of uh, performance uh, appraisals or you know punishments and uh, some kind of uh, you know um, some some kind of a uh, uh, opportunity to redeem diminishing performance are all offered so accurate procedures developed after careful analysis of a person who can work and what's the quantum of work that you can give what happens so that has started replacing traditional decision making that used to take place in, in, in the previous times. So we are basically looking at the growth of some of these theories. Scientific management theory, it also implies that the needs of management are the same as those of employees. 
and labor unions are unnecessary. I can give you examples of that. You know, in fact, uh, you know, uh, I mean, an example coming from India, nobody would believe that in India, with you know, with some so much of poverty in one area and so much of welfare issues coming up here and there and lots of publicity, negative publicity that you can get to hear on India. There's also a very, very big house called the Tata House or the Tata uh, as an, you know, uh, um, Tata House is a Tata company, which was started off by one single individual. Now that company ran for probably, you know, it's uh, not sure with 70 years or 80 years or maybe yeah, they've already done that. They've, you know, they've, they've, they've vast, they have developed so many products and they are into everything. Now, in that company, there has never been a strike. There has never been a protest. They had Tata steel, Tata locomotives, Tata engines, Tata many, many things. TATA, -TA, you can look it up. They said they have never had people protest. Their employees protest. Because of the orientation of the sector, of the orientation of the charismatic leadership that looked at the employees also as part and parcel of the growth and has constantly taken care of them. It's provided them housing as long as they were there in working. It provided them schools, it provided them colleges, it provided them various welfare provisions which are necessary for people in addition to working in the factories. So as a result of factory welfare laws, which is scrupulously followed by the Tatas, the management and the employees have stuck to scientific management, the growth of loyalty, and a feeling, this is my company, I execute what happens in this company, even if I'm at the lowest rung. It allowed people to do flexible specialization, move on. A very low level of union membership, not necessary. In fact, something like that happens uh, even in Australia in many, many private companies. Not many people like to join unions because they know there's this huge enterprise bargaining. If I need something, I can go to the management and say, I think it's a fair call. I need this, not just for myself, but a whole lot of people like me. So that gets, it, that gets accepted. The organization scientifically select, train, and develop each employee rather than passively leaving them to train themselves. So mentoring programs, training programs, induction programs, all of that was part and parcel of such an opportunity in the so-called scientific management theories that we are looking at. Then of course we have what is called McGregor's management theory that also came up. It started Douglas McGregor in the 60s, uh, propounded this theory. They kind of divided people into, there are two types of people, people who belong to theory X and people who belong to theory Y. The theories of management in a way are also called theory X and theory Y. Let's look at some of the key elements of theory X. Theory X is all about direction and control. So what does it say? It says management is responsible for all aspects of production that gets coordinated. Management guides its employees effort to match the organization needs. Hey, I want you to work for me in that following direction. I'll do what I can do for you. I'll persuade you, I'll incentivize you. And of course, if you don't work well, I'll also put you under diminishing performance. So that sort of a thing is direction and control. 
Most companies make assumptions about theory X. What, is, what are those assumptions? Assumptions basically are that workers are lazy. Money is the primary motive for work. And people must be continuously directed and guided. Managers are more likely to be far away from their workers. They only meet to give orders and to rebuke and take a stick rather than a carrot. Focus on the negatives. They never focus on the employees' positives. And that's the kind of orientation people have. Now, what are the key elements of theory Y? In the interest of economic purposes, management is responsible for manufacturing. The workers are not passive. The workers are always inspired to do their best. One advantage of work is money. True, everybody needs that. So therefore, individuals love their work because they receive money. They are being given responsibility and they can be self-directive. Management needs to have the framework to allow workers to devote themselves to the needs of the company. In other words, workers need to find a meaning and a purpose and the creative need to work with the tools, the apparatus, the systems, the concepts of the organization. So workplaces which are known to be like families and communities, I know it's looked like a fairy tale, but there are workplaces like that. There are people, if you ask them, how long have you been working here? They say 20 years. Ask the next question. 20 years in the same position? Yes. How? Oh. You never had a raise? Raise in what? I mean position. No. Raise in wages? Yeah, surely everybody gets a raise in wage. But you're still stuck in that position. Yes. How come? I love it. Now, what can you answer? What can you question further? So it's love. It's, it's a contentment. It's a value that the organization has kind of sold, marketed with this individual. Contentment. It can happen. And it happens a lot in family-centered organizations. And that's something that one needs to look at. McGregor's management theory also talks about other issues. Managers, for instance, establish the conditions that allow workers to make their best efforts to achieve the organizational objectives. Managers love their teams. Team leaders love their teams. Workers love their leaders. Managers are there to promote and communicate with workers. It is possible that they will communicate and collaborate and provide and collect input. What does that mean? That means the entire process in an organization, I mean, the organization is seen as a process organization. It's people who work together. It's people who come together. They work on a project. They give the input. They co-create that environment. McGregor's management theory, of course, has some criticism. The theory, of course, people talk about organizations are dynamic, they keep changing, it all depends upon the financial leverage that an organization has, depends on the times, come COVID-19, Many organizations have been slapped off. 
as a result of the unfortunate dynamic pressures that have been, you know, that have come around the organizations. Many organizations have folded up. Travel, tourism has folded up almost. Negligible tourism can never take place. People are afraid. There's fear on various counts. Vaccine. Lots of, lots of things are still floating around. Which vaccine is good? Why is the other one good and why is this one not good? Why did it happen in Europe and what will happen in Australia? Did we test it? All these questions will impact on the organizations, will impact on the tourism. And very, very sincerely, governments, economic organizations, management organizations are all trying their level best to see that we improve our life. We do, we, we go out on tourism. We take a holiday, we take a break. I know $200 may not be anything as an incentive for many people to take a flight and to go to Keynes or something or the other. But there's a reason why it is all done, anticipating. But to somebody, it's an incentive. To somebody, it might give an opportunity, a little more breathing time to do so. So all things, will have, they're all need-based, they are hypothesized that they will work, and we work on that. So the underlying basis for decision-making and the origins of influence in organizations can be blurred. You can gamble with things. You take a chance. You couldn't take a chance with COVID-19, the way it is, but you do take a chance that the economy will also recover organizations will also recover. But one thing is, the critic says, the Gregor's management theory does not understand how organizations are captured by ideals and agendas involved in the implementation of social service and policy. There is criticism that comes from feminists, which probably sometimes attacks that most organizations leadership is gender based. I mean, more, more males are at the top of the organization. That there is a kind of a patriarchal climate. Sometimes not every organization can present a holistic viewpoint on the company or organization. So there are various thoughts at the end of the day. In this one and a half to two lectures, what we tried to look at was understand the various metaphors that we have utilized, that have been utilized in explaining what an organization is all about. A couple of thoughts I would like to leave with you, primarily around How do you see a social work organization? An organization that deals with the clients, an organization in which all of us at some point of time might work. What's our space? How do we orchestrate the needs of the clients? How do we take them upwards? How do they bring programs from up to bottom line? Bottom line. How's the feedback going within the organization? Between the needs of the people and the program content, program philosophy, program methodology that we've got. How often we consider the question of our organization being vital to the community, of being relevant to the community, of being focused on the community. And how do we collect that focus? How do we become relevant? These are some questions I'll leave here. 
for you. And um, we'll meet again in a full level third lecture. Thank you.